tonight on CBC Vancouver News. You can't really control it. With COVID numbers surging, 160 students and staff told to self-isolate at a BC school also. It's horrific news. Tragedy in Surrey. A stabbing leaves a woman dead and a toddler seriously hurt. And... It would be a pity not to have trick-or-treating this year. Tricks, no. Treats, yes. Delivering the goodies during a pandemic. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Well, it's not a record to be proud of. BC health officials are reporting the highest single day COVID-19 case total since the start of the pandemic. Yes, it confirmed 203 new cases today. Many of the recent clusters directly connected to weddings, funerals and celebrations of life. Dr. Bonnie Henry says right now, even small gatherings are risky, whether inside or outside. BC now has a positivity rate of 2.5%. That's well above the 1% it had been hovering near for much of October. There are now 1,766 active cases in the province. Two more people have died for a total of 256. 70 people are in hospital, 21 in ICU. There are three new outbreaks at healthcare facilities as well. And tonight we're hearing of BC's first official school outbreak. 160 students and staff at a Kelowna Elementary School have been told to stay home. Dan Burrett joins us live with more on this. Dan, up until now, the most we've seen is a single classroom isolating. So what's the difference here? Interior Hill says all students from kindergarten to grade three at Ecole de Lance au Sable now and the staff who work with them have been ordered to stay at home and self-isolate until November 4th. That's because three people within what's called the school community tested positive. Interior Health says the exposure occurred after some of the school community members, quote, mixed with select cohorts and one another, while others mixed during a break. It says those isolating were physically and administratively separate from the rest. Some parents say they're not surprised. I think it's actually remarkable that the school went this long without it because, I mean, you've got however many hundreds of of kids and then they're going home to play with their neighbors and their friends and their family members and these bubbles are getting there. I mean, there's bubbles all over. It's just, it's a matter of time before somebody comes in contact with COVID. Right. Two of Boussier's three children are now at home after they were potentially exposed. Her oldest in grade four is still going. She says their biggest disappointment is missing Halloween. Indeed, Dan, and more than 200 cases today, the first school outbreak, this all at a time when things were looking pretty down. But Dr. Henry did have something positive to say today regarding a vaccine. Yes, our provincial health officer says it's possible some British Columbians could have access to a COVID-19 vaccine by early next year. More than 150 vaccines are being developed around the world. Ten of those candidates are in phase three trials, meaning they're being tested right now on volunteers. It's very likely that we'll get the early parts of some vaccines. So we won't have enough to vaccinate everybody all at once, but it'll be coming in stages, um, probably starting hopefully as early as January. Now, as for who would get the vaccine first, Dr. Henry says likely candidates are healthcare workers, seniors, people with underlying health issues, and those who live in close quarters with others. Anita, Mike. All right. Thanks, Dan. Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. And to Surrey now, where a toddler has been seriously hurt and a woman is dead after a triple stabbing in the Newton neighborhood last night. As Tina Lovegreen tells us, police say this is likely a case of family violence. Shock and sadness fills the Surrey neighborhood today. It was so terrible when I heard about that. The stabbing appears to stem from domestic violence, which has left one woman dead and seriously injured a man and a two-year-old. It was a happy family. Baby always waved to my daughter and we always saw that. RCMP were called to the house just before 9 o'clock last night. All three victims were rushed to hospital where the woman later died of her injuries. Police say the other two are recovering. Police say a suspect ran from the home and was arrested just a few blocks away. What they aren't telling us is the relationship between the suspect and the victims. The individuals were known to each other, um, so there is no threat to public safety. 
Neighbors say the family never caused any trouble. They appear uh, to be nice people, uh, very uh, homely people. Uh, I did not have any, we did not hear any complaint about their behavior. The victims are said to be South Asian and people we spoke with from the community say even if there were problems of domestic abuse, it's not something that's often talked about openly in the community. I don't know if it's our brought up is like that, that we cannot go out to say things. So yeah, something should be changed. Experts say one in 10 women are at risk of domestic violence in Canada, and a woman is killed every six days by her intimate partner. So these are horrific statistics that I think many Canadians uh, are would be surprised to know that that's the impact, that that's how many women are living in fear. But she says it doesn't have to be that way. Domestic homicide is also the most preventable. Often family, friends, they don't want to get involved. They don't want to say anything. And often what happens is that that actually just pushes the woman back into the relationship. She says attitudes also need to change so people are encouraged to speak up and reach out. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Surrey. And if you or someone you know needs help, you can call Victim Link BC. It's a toll-free, confidential, multilingual service available across the province and the Yukon 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call the number there, 1-800-563-0808, or send an email to victimlinkbc at bc211.ca. Well, it's really only a few days away from the provincial election, and with advance voting ending today, the political leaders were out in key ridings, reiterating their promises. Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson in Surrey and Delta this morning, taking more time to attack the NDP. He says his party will actually deliver on programs like affordable childcare. We've got to make sure our kids can get the daycare they need, which is why we talked about $10 a day daycare for any family in British Columbia, all families in British Columbia, with an income less than $65,000. The NDP promised it and totally failed to deliver, just like so many other NDP promises that came to absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, NDP leader John Horgan was in Langley asking voters for their support there. Horgan is promising more schools, as well as expanding transportation and health care services in the region. He says he's focused on people and how they can benefit from government investments, unlike the Liberals. The BC Liberals have a plan that does not involve the people who need the help the most. Their plan is about giving breaks to buy new yachts. Uh, you'll get a tax break. If you want to buy a yacht, I'm not your guy. If you want to have services in your community, if you want to have a government that's focused on you each and every day, the BC NDP is the way to go. And Green Party leader Sonia Firstino was in Seanigan Lake addressing more supports for the education system. Firstino says the current NDP back to school plan leaves some students struggling, parents worried, and teachers feeling unprotected. Our plan brings new resources in right now to address the shortfalls in the NDP's back to school plan while ensuring that more resources are brought to the table for the long term support for public education that is needed. She says schools need more resources now if they are to develop comprehensive remote and hybrid learning options. There are a number of ridings the NDP is hoping to get its hands on in order to achieve that majority government scenario. Tonight, our Tanya Fletcher takes us through the six ridings that could make or break a party's hopes of winning the election. There are 87 seats in British Columbia, but all it takes is the flipping of a few to trigger significant change. Here's a look at some of the swing ridings in the Lower Mainland that could make all the difference. Coquitlam Burke Mountain has swung back and forth for years. The vote-rich suburban seat wound up being the closest race in the last provincial election. The NDP lost the riding to the Liberals by the smallest margin in B.C., just 87 votes. That's why the New Democrats are pulling out all the stops to try to snag it this time around. Promises of new schools and recruiting a high-profile candidate in former MP Finn Donnelly will be in a fight to try to unseat incumbent Liberal Joan Isaac. 
after Coquitlam Burke Mountain, the next closest race in 2017 was Richmond Queensboro. The NDP hasn't won a seat in Richmond since 1972, but last time around, this seat was determined by fewer than 200 votes. Transportation has been front and center here, namely the drawn out replacement of the George Massey Tunnel. The Liberals are banking on their original plan to build a bridge to safeguard the seat. Incumbent Jazz Joe Hall is again being challenged by the NDP's returning candidate, Amon Singh. Moving over to Maple Ridge, we find one of the most significant battlegrounds of this election. Two key ridings have flipped back and forth here for decades. The NDP narrowly won both in 2017. Homelessness has been a hot button issue for years, and the Liberals are trying to leverage their law and order message to take back the region. In Maple Ridge Mission, they're hoping Chelsea Midas can swipe the seat from incumbent Bob Deeth. And in Maple Ridge Pitt Meadows, NDP incumbent Lisa Baer will try to hold on to her seat against Liberal candidate Cheryl Ashley. Now let's head to the heart of the urban vote and Vancouver Falls Creek. It's a riding both leaders have circled back to repeatedly over the course of this campaign. Traditionally, it's a liberal stronghold, but the margin of victory has shrunk increasingly in each of the past three elections. They're desperately trying to hold on to the seat by driving home their crackdown on crime message, while the NDP is hoping the promise of an elementary school for Olympic Village will sway the young family vote. Former Vancouver mayor and longtime liberal incumbent Sam Sullivan is up against Brenda Bailey for the New Democrats. And finally, over to Surrey, home to a total of nine seats. It's the region with the most to gain and the most to lose. The NDP has Surrey Cloverdale squarely in its sights, another riding where they've gradually been making gains over the past few elections. The Liberals, though, are attempting to leverage anger over a local issue to keep it in their grips. They're promising a referendum on the decision to get rid of the RCMP in favor of a municipal police force. Liberal incumbent Marvin Hunt will be met by a well-known contender for the NDP, former city councillor Mike Starchuk. In the end, the NDP will need to pick up at least three more seats in order to hit the 44 required to form a majority government. And these are the Metro Vancouver ridings that will be key to paving the way to victory in this vote. Kenya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Our province used to be known as the Wild West of political financing because there were no limits to the amounts deep-pocketed donors could spend. Well, all that has now changed. New rules brought in at the end of 2017 banned union and corporate donations and capped individual contributions at $1,200 a year. CBC data journalist Tara Carmen analyzed Elections BC contribution data to find the effects of these changes, and she joins us now with more. So Tara, how have the contribution limits affected the amount of money the party, parties are actually able to bring in? Well, Mike, I think you can see the effect of the contribution li limits pretty clearly on this chart. We see in 2017, contributions to all parties spiked, which they often do in election years. But then they kind of fell off a cliff uh, going into 2018 after the new limits took effect. And we see that both the Liberals and the NDP really took quite a big hit here. But where we start to see the differences is if you zoom out a little more and look at 2015 and 2016, look at where the Liberal donations were. They were around eight, nine, twelve million dollars a year. Whereas after the new rules came in, they're down around four million dollars a year. But for the NDP and the Greens, both of those parties are not far off in 2018 where they were in 2016, back before the rules changed. So these election limits appear to have been successful in leveling the playing field. They certainly seem to have been, yes, but why is it that the Liberals seem to have been more affected by this? Well, that has to do with where the parties are getting their money from. Now, before the limits went into place, the BC Liberals were getting about two-thirds of their contribution from businesses. Now, the NDP were also pulling in significant amounts from unions, but they were less dependent on those donations. And the Greens had banned union and corporate donations even before 2017, so they were the least affected of anyone. But the difference here is both the NDP and the Greens get a bigger share of their contributions from these individual donations of less than $250. And those are the types of donations that are not affected by these caps. Okay, so what has the effect of all this been on the overall campaign? 
Well, that's a bit of a tricky one, Mike. Um, the campaign has certainly been scaled back. Uh, leaders are flying less, holding fewer big events, but that's also very likely the result of COVID-19. So it's hard to say what the overall effect has been. It is likely that parties are relying more on volunteers. In the past, we used to see unions in particular paying the salaries of NDP campaign staff, but those sorts of in-kind donations are no longer allowed. All right, thanks for crunching all those numbers. CBC data journalist Tara Carmen, thanks. With low overnight temperatures in Manning Park in the next few days, there are growing calls to resume the search for missing hiker Jordan Natterer, and it appears those calls may be answered. The Vancouver Police Department is tentatively planning to relaunch its search. A drone will be dispatched tomorrow to research specific areas. It's believed that the 25-year-old headed out for an overnight hike on Thanksgiving weekend and never returned. After a five-day search of Manning Park, police called it off. But Natterer's family launched their own while pleading for the official search to be resumed. Police in the Okanagan are asking sex workers there not to respond to solicitations from a man previously convicted of assault. 39-year-old Curtis Sagmo lives in the area of Salmon River Road in North Vernon, and police say sex workers should avoid calls from that area. Sagmo was convicted in February for running into a sex worker with an all-terrain vehicle on a farm north of Vernon. He served one day in jail and probation after time served in custody. As part of his release, Sagmon is not allowed contact with sex workers. Documents obtained by CBC News suggest the cost of policing the coastal gas link pipeline conflict in northern B.C. was more than $13 million between January of 2019 and March of this year. For almost two years, the RCMP have maintained a near constant presence on the Maurice Forest Service Road, about 300 kilometers west of Prince George. It's a remote logging road through the heart of the Wet'suwet'en Nation's traditional territory. Mounties have been there to uphold a B.C. Supreme Court injunction, first granted to Coastal GasLink in December of 2018. The pipeline is part of an estimated $40 billion natural gas project. The Pope is endorsing civil unions for same-sex couples. In a documentary that premiered in Rome today, the pontiff said, quote, homosexual people have a right to be in a family. They are children of God. Pope Francis also says same-sex couples should be legally covered under a civil union law. These are the Pope's strongest comments on the subject since saying he shouldn't be passing judgment. Many in the Catholic community are applauding the move, saying it's the first time the Pope has spoken in support so clearly. To see it, that he agreed to put it in a documentary is a, another step forward because he's consistently uh, made these kinds of statements which are progressive, but he has uh, inconsistently not put it into writing. And so that's, a, well, that's just a, another step. That interview done today in Vancouver. Dignity Canada is a group of Roman Catholics working for the development of the sexual theology of the church, especially as it impacts LGBTQ members. Johanna Wagstaff here now with our first check of the forecast. Uh, first of all, Joe, what the hell? <laughs> Uh, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Mm. Yes. What the hail was the question today because <laughs> pea size and larger hail fell in very isolated pockets across parts of Metro Vancouver, whereas some of you are saying, well, I had a beautiful fall day. So I will show you what that looked like on the satellite and radar, but we're actually still getting a few very isolated convective pockets. Uh, take a look at the uh, uh, pictures out of Maple Ridge from earlier today. Pea size hail, heavy downpours. Again, this very isolated cell just drifted south of uh, Highway 1, sort of dissipating before it hit the water again. Also getting reports in East Van. I can confirm that one. And uh, out towards South, south Abbotsford and then in parts of Burnaby. Really just very isolated pockets. Here's what it looks like on the satellite and radar from earlier today. Again, just this general north to south drifting of these isolated cells. Uh, we are in an unstable air mass. Uh, the big system is sitting offshore, but there's a bit of a convergent zone today that ran from Metro 
center of Vancouver down through the Cascades and in fact a report of a funnel cloud earlier today between Everett and Seattle sort of indicating that unsettledness and you can see a few lightning strikes showing up just south of Seattle right now so uh, nothing that would have given a big synoptic rain event meaning rain for everyone but watching for those isolated showers again tomorrow this is this big system offshore though you can see sneaking in over the satellite and radar I'm just going to take you through to tomorrow afternoon when that rain starts to sneak into the island that's going to work its way down to the south coast and I will talk more about that coming up but I've just got to show you guys the uh, majestic sunset tonight we're just catching a bit of the pink cloud behind me Ooh. I don't know if uh, you are distracted by the also majestic dog but it's a gorgeous <laughs> evening out there if you can just poke your head out to see some uh, pink clouds it's a pink sunset the funny thing is I was just going to say that I'm a little distracted by Rodney back there <laughs> thanks Johanna well, from building shoots to setting up obstacle courses, Vancouver neighborhoods are coming up with creative ways to hand out Halloween candy during the pandemic. Yeah, in a normal year, houses in trick-or-treating hotspots get hundreds, uh, sometimes thousands of children crowding to their doors. As Eva Uguen Senj reports, they're committed to keeping things safe and fun. It's an unusual but efficient delivery system, sending treats right into kids' bags. But if you're not up to MacGyver a 10-foot slide, there are less ambitious solutions. So we'll be setting up here downstairs uh, outside. Hopefully the weather will be nice with some space between us and the kids. We'll have masks on and then we will um, give the treats with either tongs or through a tube or something so that there's some spacing. More than 1,400 trick-or-treaters rang Bruce Verchere's doorbell last year but that probably won't be the case this time around. This is not the year where we're going to have hundreds of kids going to uh, hundreds of houses in, in large groups. It's, for me, it's one of the funnest nights of the year and it's something I love about this neighborhood. So I'm, I'm hesitant to sort of let it completely go. Others are opting for a simpler version of the candy shoot. So we're gonna put some kind of barrier on this side and one on this side and it's quite steep and it's pretty smooth. So we can just stand at the top and slide candy down. Families in this housing complex are making physical distancing part of the costume experience, using props like yoga mats, tombstones and chalk outlines. So naturally find a way to keep kids six feet apart so you don't feel like you kind of have to go, oh, space, back up, back up, and spend the whole, the whole night kind of marshalling that versus enjoying it. They're following public health guidelines and keeping the activities to the 55 families that live in the complex. Really, really respect that some people don't want to play this year and they don't want to have people coming to their house. A little bit of extra effort from parents and communities, but Halloween enthusiasts say it's worth it to give kids some sense of normalcy. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. Super creative. Very creative. I am so impressed. And Mike, I can't wait to see what you are going to do. I hope you got some inspiration there. Oh, absolutely. Especially, you know, hanging out on your second floor, I guess, at night and firing stuff down a long tube to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, th no throwing candy at No, them, exactly. One way to do it. Okay, just a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. This newscast is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Take a look. Well, we're just days away from our election here in B.C., the U.S. election, just a couple of weeks away, and there was a real possibility we could have been heading to the polls in a federal vote. Why we won't be, next. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream tonight. Well, immigration to Canada has slowed to a trickle since COVID-19 closed international borders back in March. That means we are unlikely to admit all of the people originally planned for. As Shana Luck reports, the concern is that could lead to a labour shortfall. Hello, Dada. Hanlon Barlamento speaks with her husband each day by video conference, their baby by her side. It makes her sad to see the baby reaching for the screen. My daughter is um, looking for a father figure and he can't be here with us right now. They're in Halifax while he's in the Philippines, waiting to emigrate. The family hasn't been told when their application will be processed. After everything started, they don't even know. They can't say anything. According to a senior economist at RBC, this kind of scenario is concerning for Atlantic Canada. If this can keeps up, you know, we're, we're in danger of uh, falling off track. 
Andrew Agopsowitz has analyzed the latest numbers released by the Federal Immigration Department. He predicts Canada will take in only 70 percent of the immigrants it aimed to attract this year. He says that could be costly, as this region relies heavily on immigrants to grow its labor force. The Atlantic provinces are less prepared, I think, to handle that, uh, that shock than, say, you know, uh, central, uh, uh, central Canada or the West. This immigration lawyer often helps employers trying to bring in international health care or critical infrastructure workers. You, know, you have employers who are working really hard to get people here uh, and want them here yesterday, um, and then they're afraid they're going to lose these people to move to maybe a different you know, country or, or just decide that they're, not, they're going to stay put. Prince Edward Island is still leading the country in population growth, although it has slowed. The local Chamber of Commerce isn't worried yet, but its members are watchful. We're seeing also some new interprovincial migration that's happening. PEI and the Atlantic provinces are seen as a, as a very safe uh, uh, destination. Her members are re-examining their hiring strategies. Overall, from an immigration perspective, I don't think it's time to, to sound the alarms. Immigration Minister Marco Mendicino acknowledges COVID has had an impact, but says through measures like putting more services online, his department is still making progress towards its processing goals. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. Okay, just ahead tonight, we've got the latest on the U.S. election campaign. And we may well have been going uh, to the federal polls for a vote, uh, but there was a vote of... Uh, Confidence in the House of Commons today, we're not going uh, to the polls in a federal election, which I think a lot of people in this province are probably quite uh, happy about. Uh, and we, of course, have our election here. We do, and CBC will have all the coverage for you on election night. That's on Saturday. We have the pregame show starting at 7 o'clock. That goes till 8. That's when the polls close. And then we're going to be bringing you those results as they come in. We're doing it socially distanced this year, a yes. little bit different, but it's going to be an exciting night. I think we're 7.2 feet apart on the Something anchor desk. Like that, that yeah. <laughs> of course, it'll be on uh, CBC Radio, and it'll be online for you as well, starting at uh, 7 o'clock on Saturday night. Back we'll be back in a few moments. to Ottawa, where the federal Conservatives wanted a committee to investigate Liberal corruption, while the Liberals made that demand an election trigger. And with the threat of a federal election in the balance, someone blinked, as David Cochran explains what happened at today's confidence vote was ultimately about control. With Parliament set to pop, Jugmeet Singh let the air out of the balloon. The New Democrats will not give Prime Minister Trudeau the election he's looking for. They didn't give Trudeau an election, Mr. Singh, but New Democrats gave him their votes, which was all the Liberals needed to carry the day. Je déclare la motion rejetée. With the outcome clear, the Conservatives attacked Trudeau for killing their committee with the threat of an election. Did he consult with Dr. Theresa Tam about a federal election p potentially spreading COVID-19? Will the Prime Minister admit he's willing to put his electoral fortunes ahead of the well-being of Canadians? The well-being of Canadians is what this government has been focused on since day one. The Liberals argued the anti-corruption committee the Conservatives wanted would make Parliament unworkable. Its very structure and purpose enough to provoke an election. It is a motion that really drips with no confidence in the government. I vote against the motion. And so the NDP, the Greens and Independents voted with the Liberals, careful to point out they weren't voting for Trudeau, rather voting against a pandemic election. Uh, his arrogance, his entitlement in thinking that uh, he doesn't have to answer questions and he literally would plunge Canadians into an election during a pandemic. The Conservative committee is dead. The idea of a committee to study pandemic spending still alive. The fact that we're suggesting the creation of this special committee uh, shows you right there that we're, we're not hiding, we're afraid of anything. Making this a confidence vote was a power play by the Liberals. The Prime Minister got what he wanted without giving anything to the opposition. The question is if the election threat cost him with Canadians. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Many Asian people across our country have noticed an increase in racist incidents since the pandemic began, and they're speaking out about it. 
As Peggy Lamb reports tonight, they're hoping others do the same. Definitely it's not fun. It's hurtful when you heard of comments, right? Ting Fang says when she's out in public, people avoid her. Since the start of the pandemic, she's noticed more racism. It happened to her twice, first time online. In February, a friend posted a photo of her and newcomers on Facebook. A stranger then commented under it saying, be safe and stay away from Chinese people. Okay, seriously? So I made a comment below saying that please stop uh, sparing the fair, please stop being xenophobia. Because we are healthy Chinese in Canada. We practice hygiene, personal hygiene, and then we take care of ourselves very carefully during the pandemic. Fang says the second time was at work. She was talking to a man, and he blamed Chinese people for bringing the virus to Canada. Awful, of course. But what can you do about it? According to the Canadian Chinese National Council, there's been 600 reported incidents of anti-Asian racism across Canada since the onset of COVID-19. 45% of those happened in public places. 65% were verbal harassment and 60% of them happened to women. Data was collected from Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Calgary and Ottawa, but none were reported in Winnipeg. Uh, Jennifer Chen wants Winnipeggers now, to tell uh, their stories. Colby. She's part of the National Act to End Racism campaign. She started the campaign in Manitoba because of hurtful online comments that blame Asian people for COVID. I was very sad. It was heartbreaking to see those uh, online comments because I know, I know them. I work with them in the community. I, I see them as my friends. Chen says the beliefs also circulate at work when co-workers would joke about her having coronavirus. My colleagues thought it was a joke, but to me, personally, I don't think it's funny at all. Um, I feel uncomfortable. Chen says people might not feel comfortable reporting these things because of a language barrier. She says they may also feel like there's not enough evidence. She says reporting it to police isn't the only way to track hate. People can also share their experiences informally online at the Asian Heritage Society's website. Peggy Lam, CBC News, Winnipeg. Academics, students and politicians are clashing over use of the N-word. As Alison Northcott explains, it stems over a University of Ottawa professor's use of the word during a lecture. It has such hate behind the word. University of Ottawa student Josiane Chahore Biamani says the N-word can cause pain in any setting, including a university. It is full with hate. Regardless of what context you use it, the origins and the history of the word is hate. After a white professor, Verushka Lieutenant Duval at the University of Ottawa, used the word in a lecture last month while discussing the reappropriation of certain words, a student complained and the university suspended the professor. This week, referring to concerns about the climate at the university, its president said what might appear trivial to a member of the majority may be perceived as profoundly offensive to members of minority communities. But the suspension has raised concerns about academic freedom. 34 of the professor's colleagues signed a letter defending her. The use of the term as a slur and mentioning it in the context of a critical discussion are two fairly different things. The controversy has become a flashpoint in Quebec, with nearly 600 college and university professors, political party leaders and the premier coming to the prof's defence. The uh, professor didn't insult anybody. She just wanted to raise an important subject. And I don't see it as a fight for academic freedom. I see it as a fight to continue to dehumanize Black people and Black voices in academic spaces. This student is part of a group asking the university for zero tolerance around the N-word and an update to its human rights policy. I don't really see a dialogue going on. This Quebec columnist says the discussion in the province has been sidetracked. We have black students and black faculty who have been for years asking for anti-black racism to stop at the University of Ottawa. You take all of that context out of the equation and you make it about values of academic freedom. The professor, now back teaching, has apologized, saying she didn't intend to cause harm or controversy. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. With just days to go in B.C.'s election, provincial politicians are answering to growing concerns from those living in and around a large tent city in Vancouver. Those details next.
In Premier Bennett's eyes, provincial elections in British Columbia should be affirmations of faith in free enterprise and the chance for everyone to denounce the heresies of socialism. Mr. Bennett sees no reason to believe that this election will be any different from the other seven which he has won over the past 20 years. The Premier will be 72 a week after the election on August 30th. If elected, he says he has every intention of finishing a full term. And that, to a large degree, is what this campaign is all about, age versus youth. Or as the three opposition leaders prefer to call it, youth idea versus old ideas. Their average age is 36. There's no way the NDP, liberals, and conservatives are going to convince the Socreds that they're suffering from political hardening of the arteries. Liberal leader David Anderson, nevertheless, is sure that Bennett will step down soon after the election. He gives him a couple of months, perhaps as much as one year. And I think that in honesty to the electorate, he should announce who his successor will be. If it's Lothmark or if it's... Uh... Uh, Peterson, or if it's Gallardi, or Brothers, uh, he should announce it now. Because we're really, uh, I'm, I'm running against a man I don't know. I'm running against a priest, sir, I'm running against Mr. Bennett. But uh, everybody knows that Mr. Bennett is a very passing phase at this stage, that he's only got a few more months, perhaps a year, um, before he himself will step down and turn it over to someone else. The 35-year-old Anderson is strong on people issues, youth, the aged, labor unrest. But he sounds most convincing when he says things like, must we destroy our rivers to light up a parking lot in Seattle? 41-year-old Dave Barrett of the NDP is the most experienced of the three opposition leaders. He wouldn't mind seeing the revitalized liberals and the Tories split their vote so he could move in through the middle. Barrett, however, emphasizes issues such as unemployment and state car insurance. He describes the present resources policy as a come and get it gang philosophy. Barrett sees a new B.C. needing new ideas. This is a rapidly changing province. In many ways, uh, we could be compared to California of 30 or 40 years ago when a major influx of uh, people uh, took place in, in that state and uh, the, the growth syndromes brought all kinds of problems with it. Well, I feel we're at the same level here in British Columbia. And many of the people who are involved in perhaps media or economists or others uh, generally focus on the lower mainland as an area of where things are happening. And that's not true in British Columbia any longer. Things are happening in the north and the eastern part of this province that make it a very, very uh, difficult province to predict. Darrell Warren is 33, the youngest of the opposition trio. He's building the Tories up from scratch with considerable success. While the NDP had 12 seats in the last house, the Liberals five, the Conservatives were at the bottom with two. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I mean, you've got however many hundreds of, of kids and then they're going home to play with their neighbors and their friends and their family members and these bubbles are getting there i mean there's bubbles all over it's just it's a matter of time before somebody comes in contact with covid it's believed bc has declared its first school outbreak of the covid 19 pandemic all students and staff from kindergarten to grade three in a Kelowna elementary school have been asked to stay at home and self-isolate until the end of the day on november 4th BC is also reporting a record high, 203 new cases of COVID-19 today. To see another woman and a child that's been impacted by violence um, at, uh, as a domestic violence, gender-based violence, um, it's heartbreaking. A woman has died in a triple stabbing in Surrey. The other two victims, a toddler and a man, both seriously hurt. Police say the stabbing happened inside an apartment complex in Newton. A suspect was arrested not far from the apartment after being seen running from the scene. It's nice to have a little bit of normalcy in the middle of all the craziest craziness nowadays. Halloween has been scrapped in many places because of the pandemic, but not here in BC. That said, health officials are urging caution to keep everyone safe. Some neighborhoods have come up with unique ways to hand out candy to trick-or-treaters. Well, it's a Vancouver neighborhood on edge. It has been since homeless people started camping in Strathcona Park several months ago, and that camp 
isn't getting any smaller. As Breyer Stewart reports, neighborhood anger has pushed the issue into the provincial election. Well, you know, it's mostly about keeping the wind off. I don't Chris know. Janelle lives in one of the hundreds of tents set up in Strathcona Park, a homeless encampment that took root in the spring. I mean, I'm pretty happy down here living outside, and I'm here with my community, my family. I love these people. It's awesome here. But the camp is a contentious fixture in the neighborhood, and it's a clear display of the homelessness crisis being debated during the provincial election. It's not working, Mr. Horgan. So when do you stop? Say, say that to the, say when that to do you Asia. stop pursuing a dead end? You don't have solutions, Andrew. If you had them, you would have implemented them in the 16 years that you had. The problem got worse, not better, on your watch. In a province with immense wealth. There's also glaring poverty, and more neighborhoods are seeing it firsthand. Many living outside suffer from addiction and mental illness. And some residents fear for their own safety. Drug addiction behavior is scary. Dude, you're a fucking rat hole. I'll fucking stab you, buddy, so quick. Kim Allen took this video of a man threatening to stab a city councillor. And another of someone wielding a chainsaw on the edge of the park. The place that they've chosen to set up now is not appropriate for the behavior that comes with it. On Friday, police were called after a man was found bleeding on the sidewalk. While there are a few examples of extreme violence, many say the very presence of tents means Strathcona is off limits to families living nearby. Can we fill it all the way up? So they have to use other parks. Well, I think that the tipping point has been reached, and quite honestly, everyone should be safe. And I'm not sure the people within the camp feel safe. I'm not sure if the community feels totally safe either. Vancouver City Council agreed to spend $30 million to buy and rent vacant rooms to use as emergency housing, but part of that plan relies on funding from the federal and provincial governments. Despite our best efforts, it seems to the public that this is getting out of control. All three provincial parties acknowledge that the hundreds living outside need to be moved into safer, more appropriate accommodation, but the language being used is very different. We need to end these lawless camps and tent cities. The kind of urgency that we acted with in the beginning of COVID-19, which saw a lot of people get housing, uh, we should be doubling down on that. In May, hundreds were moved out of tents in Vancouver and Victoria and into hotels bought by the province. Yeah, this is a double room. It has a living room area and a, and a bedroom area. This suite is for a couple and it's now become permanent housing. So this is our overdose prevention site. At first, there were complaints from neighbours around noise and needles on the street. But Jose Reyes, who oversees the site, says things have improved. I've been hearing less, which is a good sign. It's human nature worrying about you and your family. So I think it's a very natural reaction they're having. He says the building will start its own cleanup crew and he hopes residents can become a valued part of the neighborhood. Back in Strathcona, some of those living in tents urge people not to assume everyone is a threat. I think they should all just come down here and really talk to some people before they just judge us all and say that we're all like criminals and hoodlums. But Janelle says he won't be moved on into just any temporary housing, adding those living in this park should be consulted when it comes to any solution the government tries to come up with. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, suggestions of intimidation in U.S. election campaigns aren't anything new, but just a short time ago, a bombshell confirmation from the FBI. Russia and Iran are meddling with the U.S. vote. We'll have the latest from Washington, D.C. next. And at 6.43, a beautiful live shot of Science World tonight. The rain is coming and sticking around for a bit. Well, how long is a bit? Okay, Johanna has the answer after the break.
The Market Report is brought to you by Actually, Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebate. Whoa. On select high-efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time. Let's check in now with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff, second look at the weather. But first, we're once again going to ask you to put on your seismologist hat. First, it was shakeout day. Then we had that massive earthquake off Alaska. And now a big discovery for geologists. That's right. And in fact, uh, geologists are calling this, okay, I'm calling this <laughs> the lost city of Atlantis for geophysicists. And it is an interesting uh, study. There's sort of been this uh, theory, a long debated theory among scientists that the tectonic plates that all fit together, uh, forming our mountains, our volcanoes and triggering earthquakes, uh, that there was a missing piece just off the coast of BC, the resurrection tectonic plate. And scientists out of the University of Houston think they have found it. I wanna show you an image of what the west coast of BC would have looked like 40 to 60 million years ago. And you can see that plate, the resurrection plate would have basically uh, been draped from Alaska all the way down uh, through to California and even farther south. Our whole entire West Coast would have been a subduction zone. So we would have seen major earthquakes across a much greater place than we see now in our Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, this was a big discovery. They found the plate underneath uh, northern Canada, underneath Yukon, and uh, they are calling this a, a bit of a, a mystical creature find. Take a listen to one of the two authors. I got to speak to both of them earlier today. You know, the other day, Spencer and I were talking, and he kind of described this lost plate as a almost like a geological Sasquatch. You know, like people have seen footprints and, you know, signs, and here we have, like, the first really fuzzy image of, of this mythical beast. So we found the lost city of Atlantis for tectonic plates. And that's really going to help our understanding of seismicity and volcanoes uh, here on the southwest coast, where temperatures are dipping down in the forecast. And nine right now at YVR, we hit an 11 earlier today. We are awaiting this approaching system. You can see offshore uh, a nice little ridge of high pressure has mainly kept us clear, although we talked about those isolated hail cells. Uh, earlier in the show, uh, watching for those again tomorrow, but generally the calm before the storm that's going to arrive Friday for the interior and Environment Canada has issued widespread special weather statements uh, all the way down through uh, 100 Mile House, Williams Lake to Fraser Canyon, where we could see two to 10 centimeters and temperatures 10 degrees below seasonal. That's Friday through the weekend. And this is the first early snowfall for many communities, including the Okanagan. So I'll be watching that closely uh, tomorrow and Friday as it tracks closer. For us, this is going to be a rain event. You can see it approaching uh, Vancouver Island for tomorrow morning, making its way down to Victoria and Vancouver uh, tomorrow overnight into Friday. And then Friday is a rain event for us. And that opens the door to a modified Arctic air mass. So again, a mix of sun and cloud tomorrow, watching for those isolated cells. Wash out Friday, it's going to be gusty as well. And then a cooler weekend. I do think we'll get the sun back, but temperatures in the morning will be below zero. So definitely bring out the Tuke weather. Will do, looks like a nice weekend though. Thanks, Joe. While both U.S. presidential campaigns are making attempts tonight at inspiration, well, Donald Trump spoke to his faithful. Barack Obama roasted Trump at a Joe Biden campaign rally. Here's Katie Simpson. The former president brought a fresh energy to the campaign trail, arguably making a better case for Joe Biden than the Democratic nominee has made for himself. I can tell you the presidency doesn't change who you are, it reveals who you are. And Joe has shown himself to be a friend of working people. In his pitch to voters, Barack Obama delivered a scathing assessment of the president, calling Donald Trump a liar who screwed up the pandemic, emboldened racists, and accused him of trying to steal the election. There were a whole bunch of polls last time. Didn't work out. Because a whole bunch of folks stayed at home. 
and got lazy and complacent. Not this time, not in this election. Obama is known to get under Trump's skin, and he shot back. The Democrats, all of these people that we've been dealing with, they're getting a little bit nervous, aren't they? Huh? As Trump spoke to voters in North Carolina, the FBI in Washington announced a new plot to disrupt the U.S. election. We would like to alert the public that we have identified that two foreign actors, Iran and Russia, have taken specific actions to influence public opinion relating to our elections. Registered Democrats in several states got this threatening email, appearing to be from the hate group The Proud Boys. You will vote for Trump on Election Day, or we will come after you, it says. The email, Ryan Kennelly got the one of these emails reaction. now linked to Iran. Regardless of who it came from, this is still voter intimidation, and this is really not okay in um, how polarized our election season has been so far. Russia is not linked to these specific emails, though U.S. intelligence agencies say Russia has obtained voter information and Americans need to be aware. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. An unusual sight for bird watchers in the Yukon. Still to come, why the region around Whitehorse is being invaded by stellar jays. Hotels are running at a fraction of their usual occupancy. In downtown Toronto, many of them struggle to reach 10%. Just this past weekend, the, the uh, city centre was at 6% occupancy, which I don't think anyone has ever seen numbers like that. It's pretty devastating. The Drake Hotel runs with about a third of its usual staff during this typically busy season. But fixed costs like rent and insurance are hurting the business. For the, this hotel, our flagship on Queen Street West in particular, we have the live music venue, the underground, we have regular food and beverage, we have a late night offering, we have the hotel. They all have their own business cycles and seasonality, but they've always balanced each other out. Right now, what we're seeing is they're all sort of flatlined. In southwestern Ontario, this bed and breakfast is now only offering takeout to recover some of its losses. The chef and owner says the cost of running his business was too high after events and stays were cancelled. We've decided to shut down the two major parts of our business, which uh, is significant in terms of a $350,000 loss. They are burning money, there is no question about it. This industry expert says hotels did not see the same rebound as restaurants and retailers this summer. He says their fixed costs often exceed their revenues. From a business perspective, running with less than 10% or less even than 40% occupancy rate it's not manageable for the hoteliers. With record low occupation rates and the uncertainty of the second wave, hotels are calling on governments to step in. The numbers aren't looking great for us. So we are in, I think, um, you know, we're in pretty dire straits here. We really, really need some government support. As usual, the municipality is not in a position in the city of Toronto to help with liquidity issues by itself. But uh, I have been in touch with the other governments about these very specific concerns. In its throne speech last month, the federal government promised direct aid to the hardest hit industries like tourism, but provided no further details on what those supports could look like. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto.
bird watchers in the Yukon are being treated to an unusual sight. The region around Whitehorse is being invaded by Stellar's Jays. The colorful birds haven't appeared in large numbers there in more than a decade. The CBC caught up with the director of the Yukon Bird Club to ask what's going on. Stellar's jay is a very rare bird in the Yukon. It's common in the coast, just down by Skagway and Haines, Alaska. People are familiar with the bird down there. But this year, we seem to have hundreds that have come into the territory from the coastal areas. You know, the theory would be there's there's not enough food in the coastal areas for them and they're, they're out looking for, you know, better food supplies. It seems unlikely that this many birds was somehow suddenly blown over from the coast, so I don't really think the wind is a factor here. For whatever reason, they have dispersed both north and east, right over the mountains from the coast. 2006, we had a really large invasion just like this. Young birds came over in the fall from the coast. At that time, they just sort of eventually faded out to do just about nothing again, and it became a very rare bird once again. So it'll be interesting to track and follow this invasion this year and see, you know, how long do these birds survive? Do they stick around? Do they survive the winter? And then the following spring, you know, is there potential for a breeding population of Stellar's jays uh, to become established in the Yukon? So the Stellar's jay, it's a bird that's closely related to our jays, the gray jay or whiskey jack, it's a cousin of the raven, crow, magpie. It's in that family of birds. So these are birds that are intelligent, um, active. Uh, when people are watching them, they're you know, grabbing seeds and stashing and storing seeds for the winter. So you know, they've really seemed to have settled in. It's been a few weeks now that they've been here and they look like they're planning on spending the winter, given how many seeds they're stashing in my yard anyway. And I think what's been very exciting is not only the birds coming in, but hearing uh, the stories of bird watchers who have never seen this species before, who are seeing it for the first time, taking photos, enjoying them, and communicating with people. And especially now when, you know, you know it's been a difficult summer for many people. And so I think having, you know, a bright bird appear in your yard or appear in your life has been very exciting for many people. So that's been, you know, the, really the upside and the very exciting and fun part about it for bird watchers. And I think people in general. Maybe they're just like the Yukon. It's a nice place to be. I've heard a lot of great things, actually. Recent conversations about the Yukon, and then we have this story today. There you go. Hey, before we go, just a reminder, you can always find this uh, news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan Bird is here at 11 after the National. Good night. Good night.